Um, today we have four experts that are going to speak to you about near-term and long-term solutions for getting the Headquarters Road Bridge reopened for the benefit of the community. At the same time, we protect our environment and we protect our historic resources. Everybody's really here to hear from the experts, so with that, I'm going to turn it over. As I said, we're going to hear from four experts. We'd like to have the experts run through their presentations. They're relatively short um, and save questions and answers for the end. But if you have something really critical and burning that needs an immediate answer, you know, feel free, of course, to chime in in that moment. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Stout so that we can get, get started. Thank you, Maya. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you all could make it. My name is Mark Stout. I am an independent transportation consultant based here in Bucks County. I was formerly assistant commissioner for planning at the New Jersey Department of Transportation. You've got to speak up. It's not a mic for sound, it's a mic right. for... For the uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation, just across the river. Uh, and I have more than 30 years experience in transportation policy and planning. So I'm going to make three brief points to you this morning, and then I'm going to introduce our other consultants, and as Maya said, we're at that point in time then going to do a question and answer. So the first point I want to make is that I believe that the proposed rehabilitated one-lane headquarters road bridge will be safer, safer than PennDOT's proposed longer, wider, bigger bridge. At one point in time during the process that we've been going through the past couple of years, PennDOT asserted that there was a crash history at this bridge, an accident history, that pointed to a safety problem. We went through and I brought with me one of the area's uh, leading tra uh, transportation safety experts. We combed through all that data and we disproved it. In fact, there is not a significant accident history at this bridge when it was open to traffic as a one-lane bridge. And PennDOT has subsequently retracted that argument. Looking to the future, we believe that the one-lane format is actually safer because if you have a bigger, wider, longer bridge, what it will do will encourage higher speeds. And if you look at where we are, this is the kind of setting where you do not want people driving faster. At either end, there's some very tricky curves and hills, and you do not want people picking up speed at the bottom of the valley here and heading up or down uh, the slope, as it, as it were. So we think that that uh, a wider bridge could encourage higher speeds and could, in fact, uh, in, in, increase also the severity of potential crashes through higher speeds. Second point I wish to make is that uh, I believe that a one-lane bridge here in this context is not only adequate but is appropriate for the setting. Where we are standing right now is in the heart of the Ridge Valley Rural Historic District, and you can see why. Much of this landscape, both the natural landscape and the built environment, has changed very little in 200 years, and that's why it's now protected as a rural historic district. If you travel around more of Tennecum Township, as uh, all of you did today to get here, you will know that uh, it is a very rural area. You see all the signs for preserved land, you see all the parkland, you see the uh, campsites and so on. This is very rural country. Uh, every plan that you look at, whether it's a municipal plan or the county plan or the uh, DVRPC regional plan, all of, it, all of those plans want this area to be retained as a rural conservation zone. And frankly, the township also supports that. And if you look at the town's uh, planning and zoning ordinance, if you look at the other ordinances and the local plans, you'll see that everyone wants to preserve this. Tenecum Township actually has a, a gravel road ordinance in which the citizens uh, abutting a local road can actually enter into an agreement with the township that forbids that road being paved. So that's the, the, the belief of the local citizens that they want to retain what they have. And the transportation infrastructure, the roads and bridges, suits that rural character. 
If you drove here, again, you will notice that the local roads are narrow, they're curvy, and they're hilly. Two-thirds of the bridges in Tinicum Township today are one-lane bridges. Half of PennDOT's bridges in Tinicum Township are one-lane bridges. So a one-lane bridge has been here for 200 years. It's what belongs here, and it would be actually a travesty to, to blow up this bridge, to demolish it and replace it with something uh, way out of character. The third point I will mention briefly is that while Headquarters Road Bridge is unique and has special characteristics. There are many other bridges, both in uh, Tenecum Township and in Upper Bucks County and in the rural areas of the Commonwealth that also deserve greater attention for uh, uh, decision making on what should happen. PennDOT has made some progress in this line. They, they have a special program for stone arch bridges. They have a special program for covered bridges, but it doesn't go far enough. We need to be in a place where decisions about bridges like this can be made in a collaborative, community-based planning format. And we're not there yet, but we want to get there. Now, we believe that our engineering consultants have looked into this and believe that this bridge can be rehabilitated. Uh, and we also believe that if PennDOT were serious about uh, getting traffic over this creek, and, and serious about the urgency of it, it is very feasible to put in a temporary structure. And we have Joe Griffin, who is a, our, one of our consulting engineers, who will introduce himself, but has a long uh, professional background in the construction industry, bridge construction, who looked into both the constructability of the long-term solution and also the feasibility of the, the temporary bridge. So, Joe, why don't you come forward and give us your thoughts? Appreciate it, Mark. Mark said, I'm the construction guy. But let me tell you, this is like no other construction meeting I've gone to. Horses, <laughs> grass, you know? I'm even working on my tan here today. This is, uh, this is great. I drove around a little bit. I'm not from this area, New Jersey. Drove a lot around a little bit because I got here early this morning. And I'll tell you, it, 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 this, this area is phenomenal. I mean, it is phenomenal. And uh, I can appreciate why uh, you're looking for the structure to remain. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I've been uh, involved in heavy construction about 40 years. Eight years ago, I retired as president of a heavy construction bridge builder, large bridge builder. Uh, for the last eight years, I have uh, done constructability and temporary structure designs for both contractors and engineers. Okay, So a little bit of my background, I'm also uh, registered in three states as a professional engineer, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Okay, I first got involved in this project back in uh, early 2016. And I was asked basically to prepare a uh, cost comparison, construction cost comparison, as if it were a bid. In my capacity uh, with the construction company, I was president of engineering, but I was also an estimator, a project manager, and a designer of temporary structures. Okay. Um, back in early 2016, I did prepare an estimate. The estimate was a, a two-part estimate. If anybody's seen the uh, report that was done, it's basically alternate three and alternate six. Alternate three was uh, river keepers type design, single lane bridge, reconstruction of the sub, sub, uh, substructures, and a replacement with a look-alike um, single lane superstructure, okay? The second comparison uh, or cost analysis that I did was uh, PennDOT's two lane bridge, highway bridge, kind of a typical uh, 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 highway bridge uh, for, for all types of loading. Basically, there was about a, it was in the range of about $3 million, uh, the, both estimates, but there was about a $750,000 difference, being the restoration was actually a cheaper alternative, okay? Um, I'll let Doug Bond speak to that, our other professional, when he comes with regard to the recon, permanent reconstruction. Most recently, what I've been asked to do is to look at uh, the feasibility of a temporary structure, okay? Um, Temporary structure is, uh, and I'll be honest, it's not a, a great looking bridge, but it's just that, okay? It's a temporary structure. It's intended to allow local traffic to uh, transverse the bridge, which you can't do today, okay? Um, there are a couple limitations associated with that, all right, in order to build a temporary bridge because we would look really to alter the existing structure very little. Uh, obviously, we'd have to take the barrier off. We would have to take the guardrail off and we might have to remove some of the stonework on both approaches, 
okay, in order to build the temporary structure. We'd end up building an abutment on that side, behind the abutment on that side, the existing abutment, so it wouldn't have an impact on the abutment. We'd do it with uh, drill shafts, okay, that would go down to the rock and basically support the abutment for the temporary structure. Do the same thing on this side, about 10 or 15 feet behind the existing abutment, where it's founded on uh, uh, the abutment now, the bridge is founded on an abutment. So basically what the temporary structure would do is it would span about 100 feet and it would span over the top of the existing structure. Would not affect the piers, would not affect the abutment, and would not affect the superstructure except for the fact that some of what you see sticking up here would have to be temporarily removed. Obviously the barrier curb and the guardrail would have to come out entirely. Um, it would raise the grade right here temporarily on the approaches, both this side, uh, both this side and that side about two and a half feet. And, and that two and a half feet basically is to allow uh, the approach to come up on top of the bridge and the bridge would actually sit over the top of the existing, all right? So a few uh, limitations with regard to the structure. That structure would only really be, because of, and mainly because of the turning radius on the other side. There's a company, uh, Acro Bridge, who is, uh, who's the company that I spoke to about this temporary bridge. They can actually deliver to us uh, temporary bridge in one month from the time we give them an order. Um, that temporary bridge that they would design is a highway bridge. However, because of the turning radius on the other side of the bridge and probably speed limit and everything else, this bridge would really be restricted to local lighter traffic. A okay. um, couple of the difficulties of construction. Um, the temporary bridge comes basically in pieces and it can be assembled here on the site into 10-foot sections. The bridge is 100 foot long, so that means there's 10 10-foot sections. Typically, we would have to, after this area was built up, after the abutment was built on this side, we'd have to in install a large crane in this area. That large crane would basically uh, pick up the, uh, uh, the bridge sections that were already fabricated behind and set them. We would have to have a temporary support. The way I would see it, the temporary support would probably be driven, and here again, temporary piles. Temporary piles in the water on either side of the bridge with some spanning between the two that the bridge could sit on. It's, it's, uh, and when I say temporary, I'm talking about days. Because once this, this side of the bridge is set, would be set on that temporary support. Second side of the bridge would be set with the crane. And uh, once that second side is set, temporary support's no longer necessary because the abutments on either side would support it. Uh, temporary support is necessary only because the bridge weighs about, uh, about 44 tons and to get a large enough crane in this area to be able to set a single 40 ton bridge, a uh, 44 ton bridge really doesn't work so what we do is break it into two pieces, set the first piece on a temporary support and then set the second piece. Okay? Um, probably the most difficult part of the reconstruction is uh, just access, getting all the materials in, all the equipment in, setting the crane up, and then basically erecting the bridge. The approaches, pretty conventional. Uh, to build this area up three and a half feet, you're talking about sub-base and, and asphalt. And like I said, it's temporary. When the permanent bridge is actually constructed, all of this temporary that's being put in would be removed, okay? Um, what I looked at was uh, the possibility of renting this temporary bridge for two years. It just so happens if you rent a temporary bridge for two years, you pretty much pay for it, so you own it. So, uh, I mean, I've, I've honestly seen temporary bridges in place for 10 years, all right? But, you know, my, my goal initially was to, to establish two years that uh, somehow they would come up with a resolution on uh, how to proceed with a single lane bridge. Delivery is a, about a month, and, and when I'm saying it would probably take about three months to do the whole project. Once you go ahead and order the bridge, uh, there's a bunch of approach work uh, the abutments, the drilled shafts would have to be constructed. Obviously, a little bit of the uh, removal of the, 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 uh, the, the uh, items you see that stick up on the top of the superstru current superstructure. Once that's done, then the bridge would be ready to be set. Once the bridge is set, literally it's a temporary structure, uh, the ability to open it shortly after it's set is, is almost instantaneous. So, you know, we, we originally uh, estimated it would some, somewhere be two to three months to uh, to actually do the entire construction and, and install a temporary bridge. Yeah, I, I would say an ambulance could go across the bridge, a fire truck could not. Uh, obviously, regular vehicles, SUVs, no problem. The bridge itself, just so you know, the bridge that I've been quoted by Acro Bridge 
It's a highway bridge. It takes PennDOT highway loading. The problem is uh, really the other side of the bridge. In order that we don't disturb the existing abutment on the other side, we'd have to set our abutment and our foundation, new foundation behind that, which if, you, if you've been on the other side, there's not a lot of turning radius now. So if you were to open the bridge uh, for what it's designed for, trucks and everything else, they wouldn't have the ability once they got the other side to turn. And they wouldn't have the ability to turn onto the bridge. So that's more of the restriction. The other thing too is temporary bridges um, don't, don't typically have the same uh, guide rail uh, capacity as a permanent structure. So there's some limitations there. And, and to, I think in order to appease PennDOT, uh, it would be better off that it was uh, weight limited. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, so I think the takeaway from that is that if there was a sense of urgency to get traffic across this creek, it can happen in a matter of months. And uh, it's very feasible. And we can, again, we'll, we can have more follow-up questions. So if you have some, we can come back to Joe. So that's the temporary solution. We also have the long-term permanent solution. And as many of you know, uh, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network actually has hired Doug Bond, who's one of the country's uh, leading structural engineers in dealing with rehabilitating and uh, the historic and masonry structures uh, who has come here and has actually uh, produced a, uh, a preliminary design for how that project can work. Doug is going to come forward and tell you a little bit about that. Uh, after he makes his remarks, he, he may want to take us down. There's a little path here which takes us down to the creek so you can get a better sense of what's going on down there. Uh, and then we're also going to have uh, Eric Silsdorf, our environmental guy, who is going to follow on down there and show you some things uh, with the creek. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm a structural engineer with McMullen and Associates. My firm specializes in historic masonry structures. I've looked at the bridge here for probably six or seven years. Um, and the, the question I was asked is, is, can this bridge be rehabilitated? Um, after looking at the superstructure, which is the beams and the slabs that you see here that you drive across, those have been deteriorated, right? The bridge was, was uh, reconstructed you know, 80 or 90 years ago, and they performed well for, through their lifespan, but, but uh, they've deteriorated to the point where those are no longer uh, viable. They need to be replaced. The, super, the substructure, which is the masonry elements that support all the girders and the beams, that was, that was built, as you know, in, in uh, like 1812, and those have held up amazingly well. Um, those can definitely be rehabilitated to support the traffic loadings, you know, well over 10 tons, no, no question at all. Uh, we prepared a preliminary set of plans uh, for the Riverkeeper on how that might be done. Um, and uh, we'd be glad to, to work with PennDOT or, or their consultants in, uh, in moving that forward. See the deterioration of the superstructure, that, there, there's no doubt that should be replaced. But if you look at the, uh, at the masonry substructure and look at the, the large stones at the base of the, the substructure, particularly at the abutment here, you can see how they were notched to fit in uh, each other. And then you can kind of see um, looks like a smearing of, of mortar on the stones. That is all later. That was probably done in the 80s or 90s. It may be part of some uh, repair efforts. Um, some shotcrete or mortar was, was pasted on there, which has really not helped the bridge because what it does is it traps moisture in the stone and it can actually accelerate the deterioration of the stone. Um, what, what we would propose is to actually reconstruct the top of the two piers there and the abutments and uh, insert a concrete um, uh, cap, if you will, at the top of the masonry. We repoint and grout the masonry, remove all of the, uh, the Portland cement grout or mortar that would, would trap that moisture in the masonry, replace it with a, with a much more better uh, mortar mix that, that's more compatible with the stone. And uh, this bridge could last for, for many, many more years. Um, there's really no reason that it can't be rehabilitated. I think it's also important to at least briefly speak about the environmental context. This stream, Tinicum Creek, 
is the state's highest level of protection stream. It's an anti-degradation stream called an exceptional value stream, an EV stream, and one of the only EV streams in our region, one of the only EV streams in Bucks County. And so it deserves an extraordinary, extraordinary level of protection as we look at the possible environmental impacts. It's also part of the National Wild and Scenic River System. And so uh, very important to preserve this structure. The proposal by PennDOT, particularly the idea of widening the bridge to a two-lane structure and creating an entire new bridge rather than rehabilitating the bridge will create a huge environmental impact in and around the bridge as you have all that construction equipment. You remove all of these, uh, over a dozen of these mature trees that are part of the riparian corridor. So a really big localized environmental impact. Like Doug, I also want to point out this westernmost bridge abutment here, <clears throat> again, that is part of the 200-year-old uh, uh, bridge. Part of the replacement proposal by PennDOT is to actually move that bridge abutment 15 feet further towards these pastures rather than keeping it in its existing place where it's been sustainable for over 200 years. And what I want to emphasize, and I think this is going to be best if we stand up on top of the bridge, is how much that actually destabilizes this entire Tenecum Creek ecosystem. It destabilizes the entire riparian corridor. About here, PennDOT is proposing to move that bridge abutment 15 feet, Which is essentially to the point right where this black tape is right, right behind you. Right. Um, and as you can see, that would actually create um, kind of a fire hose effect where the stream and all of its energy, particularly during high flows, is right. pointed exactly at these, stream, uh, these uh, trees in this downstream riparian corridor. Again, an exceptional value stream, critically important to have a mature riparian corridor along the stream channel. Sycamore. And what PennDOT is proposing to do is actually to destabilize this entire system by moving the bridge and uh, unloading all of that energy on the stream. So there are a number of environmental concerns and I don't want to overly focus on those. I'm happy to answer additional questions. But the idea is that there are serious environmental concerns, serious environmental controversy with the PennDOT proposal, and that the best way to protect this stream, to protect this Tinicum Creek, this exceptional value stream, is to rehabilitate the bridge <coughs> rather than replace it uh, and do additional damage and, and really destabilize the stream. So uh, very important on an environmental side in addition to the historic side. Thanks, Eric. <coughs> so you've heard from our consultants. I just want to make one other point that didn't come up in the presentations and then we can do a question and answer because an issue that has frequently come up uh, and Joe mentioned that a temporary structure won't be able to handle larger vehicles uh, such as fire trucks. Uh, just so you understand our proposed rehabilitated one lane bridge will be able to handle fire trucks. It will be able to handle the largest piece of fire equipment in Tenecum Township uh, and the design was was uh, through some uh, changes on the other side of the bridge, uh, moving a wing wall, it's actually the technical thing that's happening, uh, we'll be able to create room at that intersection uh, that those fire vehicles can get across. So we understand that, that the temporary structure may not be able to do that, the permanent structure will. And if, if you could certainly do both, it would certainly be possible to have, as Joe said, the temporary structure uh, can be designed so that it has minimal impact on what's happening there now so that you could then go smoothly into a rehabilitation project. So there are different ways to do it. I think we've demonstrated that the temporary bridge is feasible. Uh, we've demonstrated that the permanent rehabilitation of the one-lane bridge is feasible. And I think we've demonstrated that the one-lane solution uh, is safer uh, and is more appropriate to the context. So with that, uh, Maya, unless you yeah. want to say anything else, we yeah. can do no, questions. So, yeah, if there are any questions for our experts, we'll be happy to answer them. I have one question on that the engineer yeah. what, about, what about home heating trucks? Because they would probably go over more frequently in a fire truck. A home heating truck? Doug, oil truck? Sorry. You have to understand, when I, when I say limited to uh, local vehicles, uh, the bridge is designed for highway loading. So you can put anything over the bridge, and the foundations and the abutments will be designed for that too. The issue is when you get to the other side, making that turn. What weighs more, a home heating truck or a fire engine? Uh, they're probably about the same. Yeah, we believe they're about the same. While we're on that subject, I think I know the answer, but we're also including school buses as greater than 10 ton vehicles, or are they going to be under the 10 ton? Uh, well, Limit. Understand this, the bridge won't specifically have a ton limit. It'll be okay. designed for highway. Okay. The issue is 
can a school bus make the turn okay. that will exist on the other side? Okay. I mean, the intent is that if we put a temporary bridge in, uh, Mark mentioned before about uh, cutting into that bank on that side and creating a wall, all right? With a temporary bridge, we wouldn't be looking to do that. So what we'd be looking to do with the temporary bridge is, is establish abutments about 10 feet behind the existing. What that does then is, is reduces further the turning radius on the other side that you have now, okay? Mm -hmm. So it, it really comes down to a limitation on what the vehicle can do. If it's a hev heavy vehicle, but it's compact, make the turn. And, and the bridge is designed for that. It's, uh, it's more uh, because of the turning radius than anything. So it's more the turning radius than the actual weight limit. And yes. The school buses would just have to reroute or accommodate the, the turn. Or if you have some talented bus drivers, they might some be able to make that turn a little backing up, you know? I've seen these guys. Hey, you know, the, the, the bridge that, that we've been quoted uh, by Acro Bridge is a PennDOT highway loading bridge, mm -hmm. okay? And the foundations, because of that, because somebody will try to go across the bridge anyway. Uh, because of that, the foundations have to be designed for that. All right, so the foundations and the bridge will be designed to take highway load. Mm -hmm. The turn on the other side will be difficult. But like I said, if you have a talented driver that, you know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also wider than what you see here, right? Yes, well, it's uh, wider than right now, yes. This is only about 12 feet. This bridge will actually have an inside width from truss to truss of about 16. Oh, and the footprint of the bridge is actually like a 20 foot width. 20 foot and a half, I believe. And 16 feet is what we'd be looking at probably with the permanent right. rehabilitation okay. project. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I just two questions about the temporary bridge. Um, you know, you said it, you could expedite its construction and everything. How much would that be? Okay, the, the uh, I, I did a quick estimate mm -hmm. on what it would cost to do the bridge. Now bear in mind the estimates for PennDOT's version was 3.4 permanent. Uh, Riverkeeper 2.7 permanent. Temporary bridge would be about a million dollars. Okay. Roughly. And then while that bridge is functioning as a temporary bridge, yes. what would go on with the rehabilitation with respect to the bridge that we ultimately want to have? Well, because the bridge is spanning over the superstructure, not touching it, right. and because the bridge will uh, be founded behind the abutments, and it'll be founded actually on shafts that'll go down the rock, so all the vertical load is, is basically taken down to the rock. There really is very little impact on the abutments, the piers, or the existing superstructure. To the extent it could be worked on oh, okay. underneath, yep. the problem is, you know, doing, you know, pointing and reconstructing underneath a bridge is difficult mm -hmm. because you can't, at that point, remove the superstructure that's there now. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure that, you know, if, if there was some, some method of uh, uh, restoring the piers, they could be worked on pretty easily because they're obviously away from the abutments and even the abutments for that matter. But I think it would be a slower process with the temporary bridge there than with, uh, it, with taking the existing superstructure off and just making it wide open. Thank you. So Doug has a little bit to add to that. Yeah, I would say that it's probably feasible to work on the substructure, the masonry work, while the temporary bridge is in place. You could get that ready to go and then you know, remove the temporary bridge and put in the permanent bridge. It probably could be phased that way to shorten the duration of construction. I'm sure it would shorten the duration. I have a question for Eric, the yeah. stream ecologist. Hey. If, if the PennDOT proposed bridge were installed, would that in fact change the downstream character of the stream by scouring and siltification and, and moving things down further downstream where the silt would, would be deposited from eddies forming and that kind of thing. A absolutely. That, that is the ultimate consequence of destabilizing the stream. By moving this bridge abutment over here, you're unleashing the power of the stream on the riparian corridor. Those trees and that root structure are holding the stream bank in its current position, holding right. that sediment. So by destabilizing that, by eliminating those trees, you are now allowing all of that sediment and all that energy to be mobilized into the stream. And so you're going to have impacts both to the stream bank, all that sediment now is gonna go into the stream and it's gonna flood the stream with additional sediment. It's gonna um, uh, uh, bury the, the native sediments with this new alluvial and particularly the topsoil. It's gonna be fine sediment. It's gonna fill the pore waters. And so for um, insects and other invertebrates that live in the stream, you're gonna flood them with that. Also fish that live in the stream, it's gonna affect their ability to spawn in the system. So you're exactly right. The consequences of destabilizing the stream are very far reaching. They're not just the local impacts from um, replacing the bridge. They will actually lead to miles and miles of destabilization okay. and, and an increase in sediment. Of what bridge? 
of what? of the PennDOT proposal. The, the PennDOT two proposal. Lane or what? Or the the two lane okay. proposal with moving the bridge abutment further over here. The consequence of that is to uh, destabilize the system, introduce more sediment, and have a number of water quality impacts to the stream. And so, so that's why I'm emphasizing the idea that rehabilitating based on the existing piers and the existing abutments does not lead to that instability and does not lead to those water quality impacts. And that would remove some of the feeder, feeder uh, bio, uh, bio, bio, bio um, the feeder fish and things so that the native fish that do live here, we don't have trout, I understand. There, there are some trout, it's not, it's not a, yeah. And we right. have uh, fish that are coming up from the Delaware in the spring, some of these uh, food sources would be eliminated because they, would, they wouldn't be able to uh, reproduce. A absolutely, yeah. This is going to have kind of far-reaching consequences throughout the food web. You eliminate the food quality, the invertebrates that feed the, the, the bait fish, and that then affects the, the larger fish, the migratory fish, such right. as shad and herring, right. striped bass, white suckers actually move in and spawn into this. And so, so one of the key bass. designated uses for this stream is this migratory corridor. There are no barriers between this stream um, and all the way down um, to the Atlantic Ocean. So migratory fish can get up in here. And so, so absolutely, migratory fish are key to that and, and maintaining their food sources, their habitat, is a key part of, of, of maintaining the system. So moving right along, what would be acceptable to the river, river keepers in terms of having a bridge here? So the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, um, as Mark talked about, has actually um, put forth a proposal that rehabilitates the substructure, as Doug talked about, that restores the superstructure and really restores this bridge as it is and restores it to a one lane bridge. We've put forth preliminary plans proposed by an engineer with the engineer stamp um, and we are now bringing forth expertise on this temporary bridge option to really talk about how as we advance that longer term solution, which is really about rehabilitating the current bridge, how we can open this roadway up much more near term for the community and for community use. Oh, um, so you'd be amenable to having a temporary bridge as well as a rehabilitated one lane bridge in the making. That's what you could so go for? These, these are the concepts that we have brought forth that we have urged PennDOT to work with, to work on. Okay. Um, and we have done, frankly, we've done a good portion of the work for PennDOT in terms of bringing forth not just these important concepts, but really bringing forth the expertise necessary to demonstrate that all of this is doable and really is the best pathway for the community. It's the best pathway in terms of transportation. It's the best, best pathway in terms of historic preservation. It's the best, best pathway in terms of environmental protection, both near term and long term. Um, it's the best pathway in terms of cost and cost savings and cost efficiency. Um, and it's also the best pathway for getting a bridge open for this community. Whether you're talking about a temporary bridge structure or not, another thing that we've been able to demonstrate is when you look at the entire process that actually the rehabilitated process gets us to an open bridge sooner. But understanding the importance of a more near-term solution for restoring uh, traffic that is why we've gone to the, the cost and effort to really look at this temporary bridge option and also bring that to the table. And we're hopeful that by having all of our um, current and or future elected officials and sharing with you this important information from the experts, that you can really help us advance this dialogue with PennDOT to get this important solution moving forward. Because right now, we have all been sitting for years. At the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, we have been urging fast action, and that's why we've been bringing all of this to the table. But we need PennDOT really to work with us as a community to get this better strategy forward. And so that's really why we wanted to bring this and why we're hopeful I, I just, that we'll I mean, get there. It was my understanding that PennDOT will not go with anything other than a two lane. My Do you want to speak to Secretary Leslie? I don't know if it's Richards or Richardson. She will not entertain anything else. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark to talk about the specifics, but really um, everything that we have seen and all the evidence on the record really demonstrates 
that right now PennDOT is pursuing a political decision. It's not pursuing a decision that is dictated by facts or by law. It's just purely politics. Politics can change with good input from the community and from other decision makers. Do you want to speak about that? Sure. Um, PennDOT always frequently, if they don't want to do something, they go to their design manual. And their design manual is sort of their, their Bible that they look up, uh, their, their, their scripture. And their design manual says only two-lane bridges except in extraordinary circumstances. However, if PennDOT does want to do something, there are lots of different ways to do it. Uh, they take stone arch bridges, which are very similar to this in, in terms of being based on stone masonry structure, uh, and they do all kinds of creative solutions to those. Uh, they don't want to do it. What can we do as well, citizens to make something happen? Yeah, so that's really... Okay. that. Yes, that is, that is why we're bringing this together. What we really need the community to do is we need the community di directly and through the elected officials to really be making very, very clear to PennDOT through phone calls and through letters to Secretary Richards, to Governor Wolf, and to all of our elected officials that represent the communities of this region that we want and need these solutions, which is a temporary bridge and rehabilitation of the current Headquarters Road Bridge in place restoring the historic substructure, doing the necessary work on the superstructure so we can get this open. And this is really about the community giving voice to that directly and through our elected officials. Um, they need to hear from the community. I, I so, just Brennan. one. Yeah. Tim Brennan, uh, I'm a councilman from Doylestown. Uh, I've, as a municipal solicitor, I've worked with preserving historic districts and historic places. Um, and, I, you know, there's always this balance between utility and preserving our quality of life. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I don't often see PennDOT being the big behemoth that, that it is, um, necessarily always being responsive to that. I mean, aside from, I, I, I guess, what are, the, what are the impediments that you've uh, had in dealing with PennDOT, I guess, from a responsiveness standpoint? Is it more that they're wedded to the, the two-lane uh, idea, or, or is it something different? What is, a, what is the biggest impediment you've had with, with getting through to PennDOT? So really what we have seen in our interactions with PennDOT is PennDOT designed this two-lane, um, you know, demolish the existing structure, replace it with an oversized modern structure. Um, they came up with that solution a number of years ago, and they've really made firm, remained firmly committed to that. Along the pathway, they've re brought forth a number of reasons and rationales. For example, Mark talked earlier about the false information about the hazards on this bridge, right, which we proved to be false. They've brought forth all kinds of rationales, and in every single instance, we have brought forth the facts and the experts and the expertise to knock down the most recent excuse and to demonstrate, not just to knock down their excuse, but to demonstrate how and why, the many ways that the kind of solution that we're talking about really is the better pathway all the, round, all the way around. Health, safety, economically, environmental protection, historic resource protection, community protection. Um, and we bring that information forth and they sort of put up another, another blockade. So that's why I say what the real impediment here is, is the politics and the politicking that is going on around this bridge. We think it's time to stop making this bridge about the politics. It's time to start making this bridge about a safe, sensible solution for the community that serves all the needs of the community, transportation, environment, historic, ecotourism, um, and on and on. And that's why we you know, have continued to turn to the community um, to bring forth the expertise to really make very clear that we have the best solution. Um, we just need uh, PennDOT to, to be open to the sensible path forward. So, so pretty much PennDOT had a, a sort of an original utilitarian concept and it hasn't, hasn't moved from it, looking at all the other interests that are in play about quality of life, environmental, historical uh, considerations. I mean, there's only a handful of bridges in the entire state like this. So, I mean, is it just yeah. that they haven't moved? Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly it. And when you talk about a utilitarian solution, I would even say that, that, there, that yeah, the solution yeah. is not just utilitarian, but it's actually more dangerous, right? It is degrading. It is damaging. It does pose a threat to downstream communities, whether you're talking about property owners or whether you're talking about ecosystems. It does create a traffic safety concern because right now you have a, a, a solid traffic calming concept. If you start widening this 
uh, this structure and speeding up traffic with all of the turns, yeah. you're creating more dangerous conditions. So I don't even call it a utilitarian it's option. More a textbook. You know, it's it's really, but it's a dangerous path forward on a variety of fronts. And the other thing that we've been able to demonstrate is that really this bridge is a unique bridge when it comes to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Historically, this bridge is unique throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's unique in the nation. And it's also unique here for Tinicum Township because as our historic um, experts have also brought forth, is here in Tinicum Township, there is a complete collection of historic waterway crossings from the Ford all the way to modern day structures. Right? It's a complete collection from the, uh, from the history of this nation here in Tinicum Township. If you demolish this bridge unnecessarily for this crossing, you have destroyed forever that collection of crossings, which is itself unique to Tinicum and, and you know, unique to the state and unique nationally. It's very important to pre preserve those kinds of resources here in the United States. I have one more question, Maya, and I, I guess the answer is obvious. You said that you invited all of the elected officials here to speak and to represent their positions. Well, that, well to speak, to hear, to and hear, to ask questions. And to learn. Right. And to learn. Um, our current representative isn't in attendance. What has she been able to do to facilitate communication between the interested parties, to, to facilitate communication between the township, between the property owners, between the river keepers, between PennDOT? This is what I think is imperative to put into motion as quickly as possible. Has she been successful in bringing together the interested parties? I mean, I think when it comes to the current state representatives, they've been an impediment to a solution. An impediment. Rather an than impediment a, to a solution than rather, than, rather, than, rather than being part of the solution. They've been an, okay. an impediment all the way around. And that's really part of the problem. And that's why we were hopeful that all current and or potential future elected officials would join us and hear from the experts, see what is happening here out on the site so that everybody can be part of this solution. And so we are very pleased and grateful for those who did turn out. And we, we, are, we think that it was a really tremendous missed opportunity for those who chose not to.